Thank you. Uh, let me start by um, introducing myself. Um, I am, in addition to being the director of the San Diego Supercomputer Center, I have a bunch of other hats on that all somehow fold into this talk. I am the uh, uh, executive director of the Open Science Grid since 2015, uh, and you will hear that part of, I'm a co-PI with, uh, with, uh, of the Pacific Research Platform with Larry Smarr that you've heard a few years ago about, and I am the PI of a follow-up infrastructure to, that kind of brings both OSG and the PRP together into a national infrastructure that I'll be uh, focusing on. And on top of, of that, I am actually a professor of physics that uses all of this infrastructure for my own research. So I'm a user, I'm a provider, I'm a, a, a service a provider. I sort of touch this infrastructure that I'll be talking about from a variety of different angles. Um, and, uh, I'll, and of course, I'm a, I'm a geeky scientist as a physicist, and so I will not be able to hide that completely uh, in this talk. And uh, so, voila, let's get right into it. Um, my uh, talk is about uh, the uh, path towards an open global sub-infrastructure enabling digital research. And I wanted to start out by putting three reasons on the table for having an open cyber infrastructure. And then I will later define what exactly I mean by this and uh, then show some use cases and um, talk about how, how this is all comes into place. And at the end, I will make an appeal to all of you to join this ecosystem and use it as foundation for building uh, uh, even more interesting things. And so my three reasons are democratization of access, openness for an open society, and big science as a team sport. And uh, let me go into what I mean by this. Um, there is, in uh, uh, terms of democratizing access, I really want to uh, quote the uh, uh, um, a, uh, um, bottoms up uh, initiative called The Minds We Need. You can see in the corner here their website, and I've literally verbatim taken from this website the, because it's the most eloquent description of why uh, democratizing access makes sense and is necessary. Um, so the uh, objective is to connect every community college, every minority serving institution, and every college and university, including all urban, rural, and tribal institutions, to a world-class and secure research and education infrastructure. Um, I call that a cyber infrastructure and uh, with particular attention to institutions that have chronically underserved. Now, why is the chronically underserved so important? It's very simple. The uh, uh, next generation genii or geniuses or whatever the plural of genius is uh, may come from anywhere. Um, they're just as likely to come from the thousands of, of uh, non ones or uh, colleges as they are to come from the ones. And as a result, it is, if you think about it from a very high level, what we want to achieve is we want to achieve efficiency of human capital. And that's ultimately an economic pro uh, prerogative, it's a, an intellectual prerogative, it's a human prerogative. We will do best if we manage to make uh, opportunities available to as many people as we have. And if you want to do this, then you have to democratize access because at this point in time, we have a massive gap, a massive opportunity gap. And there's a number of different recent reports on this. The NSF did a, a, the missing million reports that some of you may have read. Um, there's this initiative we, which awards it uh, in, as I have on my slide. Uh, but the bottom line is at this point, we're leaving people behind. And it is in our interest to catch up and not leave people behind. And that is not even talking about all the, uh, uh, all the uh, uh, other reasons of equity and inclusion and that sort of thing. There's a strict economic and intellectual reason in addition to all of the equity and inclusion issues. So this is in essence the vision that I want to present and everything else in this talk is just detail. So my long-term vision is to create an open national cyber infrastructure 
that allows the federation of CI at all 4,000 accredited degree granting higher education institutions, nonprofit research institutions, and national laboratories. In other words, main mental model is anybody who engages in open science should have the ability to federate their resources, compute, storage, et cetera, et cetera, all of cyber infrastructure into a national federation, call it federation, call it ecosystem, call it what you want. And we want to provide the underpinnings of this. And I look at this as the necessary fourth leg in addition to open science, open data, and open source that we're all very familiar with there is, I, I, I am talking about open infrastructure as additional objective. And what I mean by infrastructure, literally anything that seems to have hardware-y kind of characteristics. So that means there's open compute, there's open storage, content delivery networks, there is devices, instruments, IoT, all kinds of things. I envision a future where the future of wireless will intersect with open infrastructure where you have devices that, are, that can be hooked into this infrastructure in order to create data that then gets compute, stored, et cetera, et cetera, within that infrastructure. And what I'm going to talk about in this uh, talk is some of the foundational principles that I think this has to have. And then I talk about the state of the art, where we're at, and who's using it, and um, uh, where we're going next. Now, I wanted to... Um, add one more that I normally don't talk about, which is um, normally I just leave it here, openness for an open society sounds corny um, and a sort of, of a, a nice way of, of having a one-liner, but recent events sort of made me realize how important openness actually is. If there was, in, in a funny way, speaking for myself, before the Russian war against Ukraine, I sort of took openness for granted. Now, it seems pretty obvious that I can't take openness for granted anymore, and that all the things that I just talked about that ultimately make us more efficient are also the tools that will make us win the economic war against forces that are authoritarian. And I, I encourage you to think about this, and, uh, and I won't uh, go into this any further. I took this from Wikipedia, and the... Uh, a, um, then how I connect it is that knowledge is never completed but always ongoing. And ultimately, I will argue that the creation knowledge, the creation of knowledge is increasingly requires multidisciplinary and multi-institutional teams. And the, this sort of, of science as a team sport is something that will come up on several of my transparencies. And let me just give you a, a startup a kit, so to speak, on big science as a team sport. On this uh, slide, I have put one, two, three, four um, uh, science collaborations of varying sizes in the, let's see, can I use a pointer? Yes. Uh, this here is a picture of the ice cube counting room on uh, the South Pole. It's a, an instrument that is deployed inside the, arc, the, the uh, South Pole ice it's a cubic kilometer instrument of ice instrumented in order to detect the highest energy neutrinos from uh, extragalactic. Um, and so this is the largest collaboration on this slide. It has about uh, um, uh, maybe five, 600 collaborators. And you see sort of the, the, uh, the global distribution of this on this map. The next one is Xenon. I'll talk more about this in a second. There is Veritas down here, here and, uh, and uh, they, uh, next to it, SP3, SPT3G, which is also on the South Pole, neighboring to IceCube. And what all of these instruments at scales from 10 million to almost a billion in terms of just instrumentation costs um, have in common is that they are large international collaborations from a couple dozen institutions to hundreds of institutions. And they are big science as a team sport, both interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary and multi-institutional. That's what it takes 
to get this kind of science done. It's the science that I do myself. I work at the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, Switzerland. My collaboration is a collaboration of 208 institutions across 48 countries with uh, a few thousand uh, researchers involved. So what do I mean by open infrastructure? Let's talk a little bit about this and talk about it from the perspective of principle. Um, the first principle is the power of sharing. When I think of open infrastructure, I want to create something that any participating institution can be, is able to share dynamically any fraction of its resources with any other. Given that I just made an argument that science is a team sport and it is multi-institutional in addition to multidisciplinary, that allows this kind of principle, allows collaborating researchers to pool resources and therefore benefit to the greatest extent possible from in-kind contributions, both nationally and internationally. And for every one of the collaborations that you saw earlier, that is an essential part of how they assemble the resources needed to get the science done. It's an in-kind contribution from the institutions that collaborate, in addition to funded at, uh, project money that they pay resources for the common good of the organization. Uh, in, in addition, um, we want, in order for, to accomplish the, the democratization of access, we want institutions to be able to share for the common good of all. And uh, in particular, to democratize access, funders like the National Science Foundation, but also others, may stipulate nationwide sharing in order for you as part of the solicitation. In fact, if you uh, um, uh, are familiar with the CC Star solicitation, set of solicitations from the NSF, that's actually written into the solicitation. 20% of the money that, of the resources that you buy with the money that you get, you have to give into the kind of organizations that I'll be talking about, in meaning into the open infrastructure. You have to join the open infrastructure and you have to give it away to the common good of all nationally. And how do you make this happen? In order to be able to create something like this, federation is a foundational principle. What, I, what do I mean by this? Federation to me means distributed control. It means that resource owners determine policy of use for what they own, and resource users or consumers determine policy of what they're willing to use. And in particular, the first line should be immediately obvious. We live in a capitalist society, that's a given. If we don't guarantee that first principle, you're never gonna be able to federate resources because the owners ultimately control the resources and must be able to take them back any time at any moment. Otherwise, this whole thing doesn't work. Um, so the system then, the federate system then matches consumers to owners respecting both sets of policies. And that is the core foundation that then allows you to actually grow into the kind of build structures and grow st or into the kind of systems that I'm, I'm aspiring to that would include thousands of institutions. Now, the, the uh, hard part in the end is behind this question or the answer to this question, how can it possibly scale to support order of a thousand institutions? And I wanna talk a little bit about what the core challenge, what the structural challenge is that we have uh, at hand here that we have to solve. The structural challenge is a mismatch between what is required for growth in resources and growth in consumers. So resource owners want minimal threshold for participation because if it's too high a threshold to participate, it's not worth their while to actually uh, get connected. Think of it as first comes the plumbing. Once you have the plant and the plumbing costs effort, once you have the plumbing, then you can actually develop a long-term growth in how you use it. Nobody's gonna join the plumbing if it's too onerous too effort intensive to actually join. And so the bar has to be very low in order to make that work. At the same time, resource consumers want minimal threshold of participation as well, and they want a rich set of services. And the rich set of services typically means a lot of effort by somebody, and somebody other than the actual researchers that use the infrastructure. And that is fundamentally a tension 
And that's the biggest problem in creating the, what I'm talking about. The technologies are easy in comparison. It's all the social stuff and the structuring and the creation of scalability by matching these disparate needs for growth. That's really hard. And now let me talk a little bit about state of the art, both by showing you how the concepts that I've just talked about are implemented in practice and how big these systems have gotten at this point. And I'm going to take two examples that I'm intimately involved in, the Pacific Research Platform and the Open Science Grid, and I'll, talk, I'll put them first in perspective with each other because they sit complementarity in the stack. So let me talk about that first. In my mind, there are three ways to build open infrastructure, and the three ways distinguish themselves where in the stack you are connecting and integrating the institutions. You can and connect the institutions very low in the stack so that an institution that joins doesn't even have to operate the operating system. That's what we do in PRP, and I'll talk more about that in detail. Or you can connect very high in the stack at the cluster batch system and storage system layer, and that's what OSG does. And the two distinguish themselves by, if you go, get low in the stack, you give away all control. Once you give away your operating system management, you've given away everything. If you, uh, uh, if you, don't want, if you have a cybersecurity or other control stance for your institutions that would not allow that, then you need effort to ha operate a batch system, operate a storage system, and then you can join this uh, is a federation very high in the stack via OSG. And by having these projects work with each other and figure out the interoperation, we can actually create something that gives the institutions options and different institutions will join at different layers in the stack at different points in their engagement. They might join first at the lowest level and say, I'm going to set aside an enclave here and I'm going to join you and let you do everything just to get my feet wet. And then later, I'm going to build up the other things and join at the higher level because I want to get this control. I want to have the cyber security control and, uh, and the uh, policy control that this allows me to have. And there are invariably going to be some institutions will never reach all, which is my goal because some institutions will have a mismatch between the effort they have and the desire they have. The desire for control costs money. It's that simple. And some institutions just won't have the money, but they have the desire to control. And when these two things mismatch, you have an economic, economic impossible uh, thing that you can't solve. And therefore, uh, that those institutions won't be able to join. So let me then now talk more about the complementarity and implementation, and again, point out in analogy what we're really doing. We're creating, we're implementing a bring your own resource philosophy. The open infrastructure is really all about bring your own resource. And uh, the way that my colleague Tom DeFante uh, um, uh, coined it, we're doing somewhere between soup kitchen and potluck supercomputing. Potluck is you have a party and everybody brings a dish. That's when you bring your own resources to the party and you get to eat off everybody's table and we all share. And that is the ideal that we're aspiring to. However, at the same time, in order to facilitate growth, we're open also to the soup kitchen model. Basically, you can come to us and eat for free. And so you can bring your scientists, you can bring your researchers, we give them accounts, we give them training, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera and make them be successful with their science on this open infrastructure. And so OSG focused, uh, is focused on the campus cluster integration. The Pacific Research for Platform is focused on individual node integration instead of clusters. Literally, individual pieces of hardware are integrated in PRP's Kubernetes infrastructure, and voila, off you go, um, you have an integration point. And in the following, I'll introduce these two models in a little bit more detail. Um, the uh, Pacific Research Platform, it pioneered integration at the Kubernetes and IPMI layer. Um, for those of you um, uh, uh, not as geeky as I am, um, IPMI is a mechanism to do remote installation of operating systems. 
Um, and uh, Kubernetes is a mechanism to do remote installation of containers in order to operate services uh, of various kinds. And so what PRP allows is you join either at the IPMI layer and we run your operating system, or you join at the Kubernetes layer and we run services on top of your Kubernetes, your OS in the pods that you provide us by joining our Kubernetes cluster. And the way that, uh, uh, in order to be successful, PRP realized if you are starting way low, you have to actually start really low and provide people even with a shopping list for what to buy. So we basically, every year, we to put together and, and validate uh, hardware installations. You can think of it as, as appliances. We validate appliances, put on the web the exact um, uh, 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 part numbers as exemplars of the kind of things that you can buy and then in order to achieve a certain functionality as you integrate into our system. And um, the uh, uh, global hardware integration at, at this point is across 30 plus institutions. I think last time I looked at it, it was 35. Um, uh, and out of those are 11 minority serving institutions, eight in California, given what you'll see the map is like, and six institution EBSCO states. And I, I, I put some more uh, information on who uses it. This infrastructure has its origins in the explosion of machine learning. So the original funded project included gaming GPUs and deploying lots of cheap, cheap GPUs in order to support machine learners, mostly computer scientists, but also uh, engineering and other uh, fields like that. OSG has its, its origin in big science, in a way. So the two organizations I've been talking about come actually from very different user communities and with a very different way of doing this. Um, this gives you a map of uh, where it started. PRP originally was a California project, first and foremost. Um, it was uh, expanded along the Pacific coast and sort of inland and it has since grown into something that is, is basically global. Um, we have hardware in PRP uh, in Australia, Korea, Europe, uh, all over the map. Now switching to the OSG model, institutions operate their own compute and storage cluster, and OSG provides software and services that allow integration of clusters. The way that the uh, sausages are made is that we basically build an overlay batch system on top of batch systems. So instead of submitting jobs to batch systems, we submit batch system daemons to batch systems all over the world. There's about 200 batch systems that we submit to globally. And um, those daemons then call home to a resource pool, and the science is actually queued in our queuing system, and then as resources become available, we fan them out across the globe they operate there. We create a, a common um, runtime environment in part via containers, in part via pre-installed software, and voila, science looks the same, runs the same all over the globe, and you've created a federated infrastructure, and then we can make pools for different communities. We have one pool for all of open science that we operate in the con in, with the spirit of eat your own dog food, Given that we provide software and services, we must operate software and services because we must be eating our own dog food in order to show to others how it's done. And then we provide, uh, people can use us at various as layers and uh, we operate entire pools for some organizations. And for other organizations, we op operate only pieces of services and they operate their pool. So you can think of OSG as a tool chest of things all of these tools we operate ourselves for our instance, but all of those tools you can use for your instance. And the two can and, and federate with each other. That's the map of OSG's deployment. As you can see, it's a heavily US-focused organization, but it has uh, green dots all over the map worldwide. And a green dot is an organization, uh, and there's 149 listed here, and I'll talk in, on the next slide what I mean by an organization. Because one of the strange things in OSG is even just the, the schema of sorts, if you wish, even how we name things is actually a challenge. How do you conceptualize what something is 
given the flexibility that our tools provide, what we call things is actually non-trivial in some funny way. So there are 64 US institutions contributed compute power last year, but we count institutions, organizations, and clusters all separately. And here's an example for myself. UCSD is an institution. It has two green dots on this map, one for the San Diego Supercomputing Center and one for my own group's physics cluster. I, have a, I run a cluster of about 10,000 cores, five petabyte of disk space in my group for my science. And that is its own green dot on the map. Now, in addition, in that last year, actually six clusters contributed from UCSD. I think five of them from, uh, actually it's not even true, um, uh, three of them from uh, SDSC, three of them from my group that we built at various times. And these clusters itself were, two of them were entirely inside the commercial cloud. So you basically deployed an entire cluster in the commercial cloud interface it with OSG and voila, you have federation, but, and the cluster in the cloud is owned by a research group. And then another one is PRP itself is actually a cluster inside OSG, and it itself is across 30 plus institutions. So you have sort of a scaffolding of, of um, uh, 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 re-entrant conceptually. You can actually build clusters that then the cluster joins, uh, but the cluster itself is built at a much lower level. And therefore you can federate federations in a way. And we actually do this. And then the bottom line here is in terms of democratization of uh, access to cyber infrastructure, 26 of the 64 US institutions are either a minority serving institution, are in an EBSCO state, or are a non R1. And now, to give you an example of what a non R1 is that is actively participating is the American history of the American Museum of Natural History in New York City is actually a participant. It federates its own resources and its researchers do research on OSG. So the museum itself is a research organization. It does research. And that research arm of the museum is actually collaborating with us, both providing resources and providing consumers. Then the next thing I wanted to talk about is the OSG Data Federation. And there's one thing that is fundamentally different between data and compute, and that is reference of locality. Data has to be integrated where it is, whereas in our compute integration, we actually run the API to integrate the cluster away from the cluster and then do via SSH login from remote into the cluster to submit the batch system. So whereas here, we actually need to have service orchestration, service deployment that is geographically distributed and we need to operate ourselves. So OSG uses PRP and the PRP concept in order to have global deployment of services, global deployment of data origins, global deployment of data caches. And we've built, in essence, something that is like a content delivery network. So you can think of it as YouTube, but it's not YouTube in the sense that you have to upload your data. It's YouTube where you can join your data and join your hardware into the system. And therefore, you bring your resources. The resources have the data on them, and voila, the data becomes available. And we, we are responsible for operating all of the caches to make data access and transparent. The, and uh, I'll talk more about this in a moment. And right now, uh, it, we have um, 10 data origins. One of them is an open science data origin for the entire community. Anybody can come and bring their data. And then the other nine are basically community origins. They are dedicated to certain communities that have joined their data into our global namespace in order to uh, benefit from us. Let me, at this point, mention two science use cases to make this, I've talked a lot about concept and philosophy and implementation. Now I want to talk a little bit about who uses this and what do they do with it. And I picked one big science and one medium science example. And I'm going to give you later examples from individual scientists, meaning all the way down to individual undergrads 
who can actually make ben uh, can use this infrastructure and do use this infrastructure. So let's start from the top. Um, there is a global quest these days on understanding the most violent events in the universe via the measurement of gravitational waves. The Physics Nobel Prize a few years ago went to uh, LIGO for this work. We worked with LIGO from before the Nobel Prize. In fact, the very um, um, uh, discovery that gave the Nobel Prize was confirmed on our, our computers. And they ran it twice, at least twice. They ran once on their own infrastructure and once on our infrastructure uh, uh, in two independent teams to make damn sure that they actually understand what they're doing. Now, what's special here is that the very science requires multiple instruments in multiple locations around the world because not only do you want to detect the wave as it flies, through, as it, it, uh, flies by the Earth, you want to pinpoint where it came from. And in order to pinpoint where it came from, you have to triangulate. You measure in three different locations, I, uh, and then you point back to where it came from. However, the fact that gravitational waves are polarized, they actually have an XY polarization, means that you need actually at least four instruments in order to be guaranteed to be able to pinpoint because if the polarization lines are badly with the instrument, you don't see it. And so there is a fundamental physics reason for an infrastructure that is global, that can be joined by instruments that are funded by different countries and are completely independent. LIGO is US funded by the NSF, Virgo is European funded. The two have nothing in common on the hardware end of things. They collaborate, but they actually build the instrument completely independently. They even use different technologies. And then Kagra in Japan is even less common, whereas LIGO and Virgo actually have conceptual uh, similarity. Kagra uses even a different and, and a detection concept on some level. And so all of these different and, and instruments then bring their data into our namespace and then can, from different locations in the world, Virgo brings it in from Europe, LIGO brings it in from the US, the actual disk space is US resident versus Europe resident, but the namespace visible and access visible to jobs all over the world is actually identical. So they can run on the same data together in order to do the science via our infrastructure. And in fact, if you look at the, uh, some of these weird caches in, in weird locations, outliers are basically put there because there are LIGO collaborators in Australia, there are Kagra collaborators in Korea, there are LIGO, Virgo collaborators in Europe, and the caches were deliberately placed near the institutions such that the data of LIGO gets cached in and is always available, the latest one that is relevant. And I'll have more on that later. And then I give you a mid-scale science use case. The, here we're talking billion dollar investments, right? LIGO, the gravitation program is multi-billion dollar investments. Now we're talking a, a, a Xenon collaboration. The Xenon experiment is probably in the neighborhood of 10, 20, maybe 30 million dollars. It is uh, an order of magnitude or two away in size from what LIGO is. And yet they have the same challenges. It's a, it, it uh, is an, an instrument inside the Grand Sasso, inside a mountain, and it has all of the overburden of the mountain in order for only uh, dark matter to penetrate all the way through. Dark matter is weakly interacting, and they're searching for recoils of nuclei, uh, uh, nuclei from dark matter. Think of we fly, Earth flies through a dark matter halo in the galaxy and as we fly through that, dark matter hits their detector, and they want to detect this. And this has never been done before, so they're basically building something to discover something that is known to exist, and they're in a race for discovery and have about a 20 institution collaboration to build this. And they've been at this for 20 some years because they've built generations of instruments into the same laboratory, one after the other one an order of magnitude larger than the next, basically. And right, uh, uh, to the two top-sided papers are in the neighborhood of, of close to 2,000 citations. This is really big impact uh, science. And um, so 
Now, what's their problem? Their problem is that they need the in-kind contributions from their collaborators across the world. So they have the instrument in, in Italy, the tape archive in Sweden, disk storage in seven locations across the Netherlands, Italy, Israel, France, and the US. And they have compute resources in Europe and the US mostly, plus an allocation on an NSF-funded supercomputer at, uh, at, UC, at San Diego Supercomputer Center. And so we integrate their globally distributed in-kind computing and storage plus the allocated parts of the NSF. And therefore, they can use the system as if it was one batch system, one data distribution network, and uh, we provide the services that make this happen. Now let me talk a little bit about how can you join your data. Um, and uh, one is obvious, you could just bring it onto our uh, storage. That's sort of an obvious one. The one that is less obvious is how do you federate a file system at your institution with us? And the mental model that we have is given that people like to hide their file systems behind firewalls, um, we have a mental model that you put a dual homed uh, Kubernetes uh, server on the firewall, you export the file system, only the pieces that you want to export into the federation onto that file server. That file server, we then install all of the software that does the magic. We operate the software that's the magic, you just operate the file system, done. And the, uh, this model, the kind of functionality that you can get at the very limited way, if you're paranoid about giving space accessible to the outside world, you can just export it read-only, and then you just export your data and nothing else. Alternatively, you can choose this part of my file system gets exported read-only, therefore everybody should be able, people who have access credentials should have access. This part should be writable by certain privileged people. And they can then use that as their home base to bring the data that they produce on the uh, federated infrastructure back home and reuse it for future computation. There's therefore an integration of locality at home and the globally distributed infrastructure in order to share as much as possible. Um, this is sort of a little bit of a, 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 a geeky detail. We have a strict separation of namespace and physical server space that has the advantage that you can actually, out of band, move things around, retire file servers, even move across the country a data set, and the users will never even notice because the global namespace doesn't change and can be served into from multiple locations with multiple replica of the same data. That gives enormous power to build interesting structures and replicate across continents, for example, and not only rely on the caching. This is my slide to uh, talk a little bit about um, the top users of the Data Federation. Um, what you see here is a ordered by project, the data read, the working set, which is the unique data that was accessed within the year, and then the ratio between data read divided by working set, which is the reread multiplier. And I've ordered all users within the last year by the size of the data read, top being the largest. And you can see then, if you go, go through this list, there are the obvious ones like LIGO that this infrastructure was partially built for. And then there are non-obvious ones, which is Minerva, Nova, um, Dune, are large collaborations that are either already in, uh, with the instruments online, and Dune is the next billion dollar uh, experiment out of, uh, experimental program out of the DOE high energy physics that is just being built. And so as they go through their construction phase to the R&D phase, they're already using the infrastructure inside their R&D uh, efforts. And then in addition, you see that there are, LIGO makes their data public after 18 months for the global community. So there is in a part of the namespace that is private for LIGO, 
that they use themselves, and there's a part of the namespace that is public for all of open science. And data effectively moves from the private into, uh, gets copied from the private into the public once every 18 months after it was finished taking. And you can see that both the uh, private and the public is heavily used. And then you have individual groups like the, comp uh, the Computer Architecture Lab of Tufts University. That's essentially a single faculty and his group who does um, computer architecture research. Or um, down here, uh, let's see if I can, the, there is the Stewart Observatory at the University of Arizona, which is basically an astronomy shop. And they do data analytics on the infrastructure. Or then there is a, a red top is a individual PI that is developing an idea for a next generation particle physics experiment. And he develops that idea with his students and postdocs and creates a collaboration of his own on our infrastructure. And then you have uh, Molchris is quantum chemical machine learning and Biomed Info is a biomedical informatics on microbial genome sequence data. In essence, we have pretty much every large scientific domain represented in one way or the other. Uh, there are economists on here, there are political scientists on here, so we have the social sciences, there is a lot of life sciences because a lot of, of uh, genomics in one way or the other uh, ends up being, uh, having, they have a lot of data, so that ends up being in a lot of what's happening. There's, interestingly enough, a lot of evolutionary biology, which I didn't even know existed as a field um, before we had people talking to us about this. And uh, so all kinds of things happen, a lot of them as individual groups, individual PIs, sometimes individual grad students. We have a summer school in person every year and that uh, accepts pre pre preferentially one person per institution or one person per group per year. And so we sort of try to spread the, the goodies in a way. And the graduates from that summer school invariably are then afterwards researchers using that uh, at the infrastructure. So we have a lot of single grad students that bring the knowledge that they learn out of that uh, summer school into their groups and then are the trainer of the group and therefore grow the scale. So what's next in 2022? Let me stop my um, uh, alarm before it beeps at me. Um, what's next in 2022? Um, we're, we got funding from the NSF to blow this up systematically across the continental USA. And so we got a, a, a project funded, I'm the PI of the project, called the, it's actually called Prototype National Research Platform. And it does what you see here on this map. This is basically the first page from the proposal, the uh, first, first figure on the first page of the proposal. And the key for this context is that we are deploying hardware in three places where we deploy compute and storage, basically GPUs and, and, uh, and storage hardware at the west coast, the middle of the country, and the east coast. And then when I wrote the proposal, I went and asked myself, what's a reasonable distance where these caches work well, based on our experience? And I said, ah, 500 miles. 500 miles is the max that I'm comfortable with having cache access for uh, uh, all kinds of reasons like latency um, access and so forth. And then I asked myself, let's draw circles on the continental US and how many caches would I need to get coverage? And I, I moved them around and, and overlaid them on the Internet 2 network backbone and picked Internet 2 locations that, get, that, that gives me coverage more or less of the continental United States. And that's what gave you this picture. And so we're collaborating with Internet2 to place caches at their pops in locations in order to make national coverage more or less work. It's not perfect. Uh, you can uh, and, and see that there's a little gap between San Diego and Houston, 500 miles. They're a little more than 1,000 miles apart. Um, sort of El Paso lies more or less in the gap, if you wish. There's also a gap that you don't see 
Miami is, a, is lies more than 500 miles away. So we have actually some other projects that fill in some of these holes. One project actually places a, a, a cache in Miami to get the lower part of Florida covered and so forth. So we're collaborating across multiple projects to basically tessellate in. We have a cache in Guam that we're deploying. We have one in Hawaii that we're deploying. So we're sort of growing this out of the strength of multiple projects, which one project gives the bulk of the spread in a way. And uh, what, what's the federation model? We're also introducing something that goes beyond what OSG did in the past. And we've noticed that people are actually, the hardware costs are not the limiting factor for most institutions. The limiting factor for most institutions is operation support, system in support, all of the stuff above the hardware. So, and moreover, if you think about it, operations cost scale something like logarithmically with hardware costs. Meaning, while volume in hardware deployed gets linearly in dollars, two systems are twice as expensive than one system, operating two systems isn't twice as expensive than operating one system. So to the extent that we can create a single team that automates the crap out of this deployment and is really expert as operating remote hardware, we can actually grow the infrastructure cheaply by offering people to join cheaply by only having to pay the hardware and we provide all the other support and it costs us not linearly in terms of system in support. That's the basic model behind the proposal in order to spread this out. And so, that, but if we're doing this, then people don't just want to buy compute, they also want to buy storage, and they may not want to buy storage and run their file system because then they need sysadmins, then they need data admins. So therefore, we're offering a concept where you can buy your storage and join the regional Ceph system and therefore, we are effectively offering a distributed storage infrastructure based around Ceph within a regional context. And fundamentally here, we're trading off usability. File systems are beautiful to use. Everybody knows how to use a file system. With um, performance, from a performance standpoint, you want all of the storage in the same data center. But from a usability standpoint, you want these regional storages to be one system to get large file systems and then use that for the user community. So we're allowing ourselves to deploy in multiple locations in a region, whoever owns the storage and owns the hardware and puts it into their science DMZ. And voila, that is the birth of this concept. And we're gonna see how well this works. We're in the process of deploying this right now in regional storage, we have regional storage in Southern California, we have regional storage in Northern California, there's regional storage in at the East Coast, the Midwest, and so we're in the process of covering regions with this similar to the caches. Uh, the other thing that's new here is, when I ask myself as a domain scientist, transparency is nice as long as it works well. However, often I want to actually be in control where my data is located. And ideally, I want to be in control and say, this part of my file system, my path, everything below this part of my path should be distributed in the East Coast and the West Coast, and that part of my path should just be in the middle of the country, because I'm going to use resources in the middle country to do this stuff, and, these, and resources at East and West to do that stuff. And that kind of user-level granularity decision-making is introduced with this system for the first time. And we're going to see how well that works and, um, and uh, as it is, it, it, and will work with communities that are individual scientists who want that kind of functionality. Um, and the other thing that is important, we have full interoperability across the legacy PRP, the new NRP, and the OSG. And that is really important, and I'll get back to this multiple times. Um, but before I go to my concluding slide, 
I want to impress upon you in particular because this audience is really the audience that I would like to see next to work with us. All of what I've described is just the beginning because when science, interesting science gets done, you need a hell of a lot more than just a storage layer. In a funny way, I look at myself as a plumber. The networking guys are the real plumbers. I am the service plumber. I plumb services to make structures that are national and global. Now, above my plumbing, there's a whole lot of other stuff that people need. Example, shout out to my colleague from SDSC, uh, Melissa Craig, who later on today talks about FAIR. All of the FAIR stuff, metadata, discovery, all of these kinds of services need to exist on top of the foundations that I've talked about in this talk. So what I'm really looking for, that we are right now missing a large variety of high-level data services that we will never get involved with. The people involved in the projects that I've talked about are much lower-level people. They're basically plumbers, high-end plumbers, very well-paid plumbers. Um, and uh, the, they create infrastructure foundations but they're not the kind of people that you need in order to build all these higher level data services. I'm envisioning that libraries have a role to play there. Curation has a role to play there. And curation in the sense that it's end to end, all the way from the data, the containers that encapsulate the runtime environment, the output that is ultimately the knowledge created, and all of this packaged in a digital book that can live in our infrastructure and can be used for training the next generation of scientists by learning how to reproduce a published result and then expanding on that published result with the tools that were used to create that published result. There is a space here for the libraries to use what I've described and built on in interesting and novel ways and ultimately take the next step in the democratization of access because there is all of the training necessary to really make access useful, all of the applications necessary as templates that people learn from, and all of that is outside the scope of, of the projects that I'm involved in. It's other people, it's people like you who would be the ones that would be working on, on those kinds of things, in my mind. And so the very... And, Again, the very openness of the CI that we create makes it possible to, to have an ecosystem where other people can write solicitations to funding agencies, all funding agencies, not just the NSF, and build on what we're creating, what the NSF supports, what the bring your own resources philosophy grows beyond the, what the NSF supports, and therefore build something much more intricate, much more uh, impressive than what we've done. And that's where I, I want to leave you at. Um, it takes a cyber infrastructure ecosystem of collaborating projects to build and operate the open infrastructure that will ultimately achieve our joint vision of democratizing access for all. And it, um, we're, all, uh, we're encouraging all of you to join us. And if you want to get in touch with me, that's my email address. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. This is really interesting work um, and very necessary. I'm Geneva Henry from George Washington University. Um, what struck me throughout, and I thought you were going to go there at the end, um, there's a piece of the cyber infrastructure, and really if we think of this really at the um, scholarship production uh, infrastructure, uh, and that's publishing. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the big challenges we've had to trying to get publishing open is uh, sort of the ownership of, um, of the knowledge, you know, so you, you went pretty much there about, you know, the knowledge that we get out of the research that's done in this infrastructure. Um, but I, I think it's going to be really critical to recognize that, you know, the publications have to be part of this larger infrastructure, which then, you know, drives to questions of um, ownership, 
and governance. Uh, it, and it's one of those things where we have not been able to crack the nut of the ownership. Um, and the publishers who do have the resources um, are still in control, even though some of them are getting to more open access. But it's, you know, we're spending in libraries millions and millions of dollars um, you know, to make the knowledge that we produce through these kinds of infrastructures um, and that we peer review um, available to people and we're buying it back. Uh, so until we, it seems like until we can get to a cyber infrastructure that includes you know, the whole enchilada, um, the entire research process, we're going to have you know, a challenge. And it seems also that the universities, um, the, the R1s, the AAUs, need to, at the highest leadership levels, step up to the ownership of that full you know, production um, of knowledge, uh, which includes the publications, uh, and take that over so that there is the stability and some level of governance. So I, I'm curious to think about how, to hear about how you've thought about you know, publication and where that fits in with all of this. Yeah, and, and um, the short answer is that that's where publication fits in. Meaning, for good reason, I work as a plumber. Intellectual property and everything around it and the need that those things that get funded via our collective richness become collectively available and open is a can of worms that sits on top of the infrastructure we built. And it's a can of worms that must be addressed, but it's a can of worms that I've declared above my scope in a, in a way. So, so the, uh, I totally agree with you that in a, when you think of it, of there being an intellectual stack in addition to a technical stack, the intellectual stack includes the publications at the top, and those have to be open as well. And, but that's, I sort of bleed ignorance and uh, uh, allow myself to or, um, focus on the lower levels of the intellectual stack, if you wish. And I'm cheering you on as you, as you address the upper levels of the intellectual stack and uh, fight the good cause of uh, open science and open publications. Does that make some kind of sense? Hi, Kurt Hilligus from Princeton University. Um, as I look at your accounting of, of how things work, and I, I haven't looked as much at storage, but if you look at computational infrastructure, um, the hardware cost is only about a third of the lifetime cost of a system if you keep it three to four years. If you're keeping it longer, then it, gets, it actually gets worse. And then that remaining cost is dominated for us, not by sysadmin costs, but by, by facilities costs, power, cooling, the amortization of the, of the data center and such. And so that means that people who are contributing now are contributing a lot more than just the percentage of hardware. So Correct. How, how does that, I mean, where does that incentivize people to, to contribute their hardware into the, if they're not getting back nearly as much as they're giving in, they're, it's really blowing up the contribution people are making. So, so correct. I, I, um, I try to slide this under the radar screen, and, and I fully acknowledge that depending on where you are in the world, the power and cooling costs are anywhere between a third, what you mentioned. In Europe, in my, in my field, where we have actually this, where each country buys its own hardware and operates its own hardware, um, the Europeans typically say 50-50. 50% -50. Uh, 50 of the lifetime cost of the hardware lies in actually the hardware. The other 50% in just operating them um, and in a way, you can think of this, that is the institutional contribution. And what you get out of joining is access to everybody's spare cycle. Think of it, what we found is that, the, a, um, that there is an enormous willingness to buy hardware, have by buying so first access, preferred access, access when you need it, but give 
everybody else access to the hardware when I'm not needing it. And when I'm needing hardware, I have extra access to everybody else's. So those hungry enough and clever enough to batch their stuff such that it can run at nights will benefit from the hardware of those who are rich enough to afford to have interactive access during the day. And there is a, in a way, an implicit benefit calculation that each and every institution makes for themselves of, is it worth it? And the is it worth it calculation has parts to that are just dollars and cents and parts to where it is worth it for me because I'm supporting science X of my researcher Jane Doe who happens to be part of this collaboration that she wants to be contributing to in order to have scientific standing. When, when you have a collaboration as large as LIGO or the LHC or even smaller ones like Xenon, there is an acknowledged need that we collectively need to contribute in-kind resources. There's many ways of contributing in-kind resources. You can contribute effort to calibrations on the instrument. That requires you to send people to Italy. That's costly. Instead, you could contribute computing resources to the collaboration that already buys you an intellectual, a, a, a competitive advantage, because when you're competing with, in addition to collaborating, you can advance your scientific mission by having those resources, using them, and sharing them with your collaborators. In, in my own field, I got involved in computing to a large part because of establishing myself a competitive edge scientifically. I own hardware because it allows my group to do more competitively research on the LHC data analysis than I would be without. So that it's a complicated uh, calculation. Make, does that make sense? And it has lots and lots of facets and the power bill and the energy bill is a very interesting one. Um, I should probably not be saying this, but from a PI perspective, power is free at the university. It doesn't cost anything. Space is free. Cooling is free. That's the way the universities roll. That gives very interesting incentive structures. Right? And I think a lot of the arguments that you're using work the best for those large scale and mid scale. And it's really hard to make those, those arguments. That you were able to it, 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 uh, uh, let me repeat your question in case it wasn't picked up. A lot of the arguments work best for the collaborations. That's true. However, from the soup kitchen up, individual PIs can transition from the soup kitchen to the uh, potluck and start out at the soup kitchen where they're 100% just benefiting from other people's money in terms of hardware uh, investments. And they can then write solicitations with their IT groups on campus in programs like the CC Star program. And therefore migrate from soup kitchen entities to potluck participants. And so what I'm trying to create is a hell of a lot of gray everywhere so that there is an enormous flexibility of becoming soup kitchen attendee, potluck attendee, collaboration uh, member, and bring your institution with you sometimes. Sometimes just bring yourself. Sometimes bring the hardware under your desk. Well, not quite. It has to be in a science ZMZ. It has to have open access. So, so they say, from a networking perspective, there are some restrictions. But we see on PRP, we see an awful lot of the hardware being contributed by individual researchers because we have a double whammy in advantage. NVIDIA doesn't sell gaming GPUs to data centers. They claim they're not quality enough. We use data, gaming CPUs all over the place. Everybody buys them for doing machine learning. 
They put them under their desk. So individuals who buy, we basically give them options to buy eight gaming GPUs in a single system for cheap. Dirt cheap in comparison to what you would buy in the cloud. There's a factor of about eight in price. That means as long as you put in a, an duty cycle on your own hardware that you own, that is one eighth of the total, you come out ahead. Almost everybody who does machine learning does more than one eighth of the total of the hardware. But nobody does 100%. So we have an enormous amount of hardware that's just sitting there idle because the machine learners aren't using it at night because they're bought all of these gaming GPUs that they're primarily using interactively because that's how they flow. All of the GPUs are harvested at night by IceCube. So there is in a strange ecosystem of mutual benefit that is at play here where the economics is often interesting and non-trivial. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Thank you.